What I'm going to do is I'm just going to make you listen to the summary. It's probably not going to be a great take. We'll probably end up re-recording it, but it'll just be good to, you know, set the scene for us. And yeah, sure. at any time, if you don't feel comfortable or if you want to redo something, just give it a breath and then say, hey, I'd maybe like to say that again. Andreas is a great producer. He does magic on this stuff after the fact, right. so he can totally edit everything. Um, not a not a big deal. We can we can take our time here. So okay, I appreciate it. Thank you. Was just real quick. Was there anything that I said in the, the pre one that you guys any topics you you thought would not would be good if I didn't talk about or no. anything you'd like I, me to add to it? Yeah, I, Andreas did the interview. I read the transcription notes from it, and I thought it was awesome. Um, I reorganized some of it a little bit. I'm going to start with some questions kind of around EWI to frame it, I think, because I think you got into that towards the end. That's cool. Uh, but I think it's good to frame that for our listeners in the beginning. But overall, I love the stuff that you said. I took some good notes. Actually, that reminds me, I want to grab my notebook. Um, yeah, let me just add this in front of me. Um, because I highlighted kind of some of the things you said. I think they were pretty great, Matt. So just be natural, man. Just say what you got to say. Uh, I'm going to try not to interrupt you. So I'll let you just riff when you're feeling it. And then uh, I'll follow up with questions after. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. Thanks, guys. Cool. All right. Let's hit it. All right. I'll start with the introduction. Welcome to the third episode of Reautomated, the podcast where we explore how automation is redefining manufacturing. I'm your host, Chris Savoya. And in today's episode, we grapple with a key question. How do you automate the non-automated? It's a challenge that our guest, Matt Malloy, meets head on every day. As the automation program manager at the nonprofit organization EWI, also known as Buffalo Manufacturing Works in upstate Western New York, Matt has dedicated his career to helping small and medium-sized enterprises prepare for a future of automation. With his passion and decades of experience in advanced manufacturing technology, Matt is well positioned to advise us on this complex terrain. We'll be diving into the transformative power of automation, how it can help break the shackles of traditional manufacturing processes and help companies with efficiency and innovation. Together with Matt, we'll explore how automation should be about creating a win-win situation for both employers and employees, all while keeping jobs. So whether you're a seasoned veteran in the manufacturing sector or just curious about the future of work, strap in and we'll, we will dive into an engaging conversation about the intersection of human ingenuity, advanced robotics, and the future of manufacturing. It's time to get re-automated. Welcome, Matt. Thank you for joining me today. Hey, thanks, Chris. This is great. Really looking forward to it. All right. So as the leader of the automation program at EWI, which is a nonprofit organization, what's your mission? Uh, so our mission is to help companies figure out how to implement really cool technologies. Uh, we do all kinds of stuff. It, it started off actually as a welding institute uh, out in uh, Columbus, Ohio, and that's where our headquarters is still today. Uh, if you go out there, we do a lot of welding, joining, forming, ultrasonics work, all kinds of you know core process technologies. But over the years, we've also branched out to a lot of areas, including what we're going to be talking about today. We do a lot of work around automation. Uh, we also do some really great work around metal 3D printing research uh, in data science. So, you know, kind of at the forefront of a lot of technologies. And our mission is to help companies figure this stuff out. And in particular, our automation work is very focused on small and medium manufacturers. So it's it's a lot of fun to work with a lot of companies, help them figure out, you know, how to how to navigate that automation journey. Yeah, totally. Cool. So you live in Buffalo, New York, right? And you serve manufacturers there. Can you tell us a bit about the economy and the manufacturing sector in that area of the country? Yeah, sure. It's pretty strong. I mean, a lot stronger than I realized, right? When I was, I grew up in this area, didn't realize, didn't have much of an interest in manufacturing earlier on, you know, when I was younger, or earlier in my career, um, moved out of town for quite a long time. When we moved back, it, it just amazed, amazed me, like how much is here. And a lot of what we do now, we do a lot of, say, automation site assessment. So we're out at different sites around the around the region, also around the country, um, helping you know to try to explore what these opportunities are with companies. And every day I see some new you know new thing in the region, and I'm like, wow, I didn't realize this was made here. You know, from small little parts to stuff that you know mission critical parts. It's uh, it's pretty impressive. So I don't have facts on you know exactly how how strong it is, but I would say you know anecdotally. It's pretty strong and sure. thriving. 
Sure. So you mentioned you serve small and medium sized enterprises and you do kind of site visits or what does that mean? What is that like? Yeah, sure. So uh, we do automation site assessments. Uh, our team has done uh, well over 100 of them now, uh, about half of them here in Western New York and the other half spread across the, the U.S. And really what these entail is we go in, you know, we spend a day working with the, the team there, the leadership team, as well as some of the folks on the floor. Uh, to understand, you know, what are the challenges, what are the needs, what are the opportunities around automation, and, and as well as other advanced manufacturing technologies. Um, most of these companies, right, have been doing the same thing the same way for years, right? They don't have someone internally that is kind of up to speed on what's what's possible yeah. out there. So a big part of our job is to help them understand what's possible and to kind of push them along that path. So we'll we'll talk with the team. We'll do a very in-depth floor walk for part of the day. Mm -hmm. You know, we'll talk to folks on the floor as well as we're as we're doing that the whole time looking for those opportunities you know so that we can help them understand you could do this do this here's why we recommend this and then we'll help them find the right resources to do those things so quite literally walking down the manufacturing aisles pointing at things kind of saying like yep. hey that's an area of interest or not Very exactly cool. and we it's it's just incredible the things you see right the it's, it's kind of like you know live version of, of the, the show how it's made right you're you're constantly seeing new factories new new products being built the way things are doing stuff everybody's got their kind of own unique way or unique spin but on the other hand after you do so many of them you start to see some really interesting trends which is great right you see where things are headed and you see common problems challenges and uh, those are all areas we can try to help out with yeah, it's kind of an interesting um, dichotomy because you have with automation, you're trying to standardize in some way. You're trying to find the commonality in things to be able to optimize them and make them able to be automated. But at the same time, I'm aware that manufacturers are very proud of the way that they do something. Right. And that's very much uh, it goes all the way back to the product. A lot of times the way they build it is important to them. That's part of the value proposition for their products. So you need to kind of be able to preserve and respect what they're doing, their their uniqueness in their process, but you're also trying to find ways that you can standardize it and make it automatable. Is that correct? Oh yeah, totally. Right. And and uh, there's there's a lot of things that are, you know, kind of I'd say simple, like very obvious, you know, places for automation. Uh, but there's a lot that are not. And and a lot of smaller manufacturers, you know, tend to have that feel that whatever they're doing is so unique that it cannot be automated. Mm. Right. And so a lot of time is spent trying to dig in and, and find those areas where it can be. And, and a lot of times it's not for a specific product or process, but it's more cross cutting type applications that you're looking for. Sure. Yeah. It's almost like you're a counselor as well as uh, an oh, automation yeah. expert. You know, you're, you're <laughs> sure. like, no, you can do this. It's OK. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. So do you only serve small and medium sized enterprises or do you also do larger companies? What's the breadth of the work that you do? Uh, like imagine I'm trying to imagine walking down one of these lines like, you know, is it a dirty little shop, you know, or is it a big old manufacturing line? What what's the breadth? Yeah, for sure. So, no, we we support uh, everybody um, as a whole. Uh, EWI mostly focuses on larger organizations. Think Fortune 500 company size uh, organizations, government organizations, you know, Department of Energy, Department of Defense, all that sort of thing. And then, you know, small and medium manufacturers mixed in there. The Our automation program is kind of reverse of that. Uh, it's mostly small and medium manufacturers. It's kind of what our mission is focused on. Uh, and then we also help some of the larger ones, uh, you know, when those opportunities come up. So we've been to, you know, we've been to sites that are, as you mentioned, small little shops, 10 people. Uh, we've been to other very large sites that are, you know, over 10,000 people, you know, so some of these, these shop tours can be, uh, you know, a couple hours, some of them can be a day or more. Yeah. Very cool. So you recently secured a $12 million, uh, grant, I guess, from, uh, New York in order to help, uh, work with SMEs, small and medium sized enterprises to implement new automation technologies. First of all, congratulations on that. Oh, thank Second you. of all, what does that mean? Um, <laughs> and, and what does it mean to be a nonprofit specifically who's focused on these things? Yeah. Uh, so, so thank you, uh, first and foremost. Uh, so, yeah, we won a award that was uh, funded by the federal government through the Department of Commerce, uh, Economic Development Agency, and then part of the funding is from New York State. 
Uh, and so the, the main thing was under part of what was called the Build Back Better program. Mm. So our, our region won that. And uh, for us, it's really impactful and important because it's completely dedicated to small and medium manufacturers. Uh, it's a three-year program that we, you know, we're committed to helping, you know, a large number of companies basically get into this like regional ecosystem, build that understanding, uh, provide training, you know, consulting services, everything we need to help them navigate this, this journey. Uh, but then we also have a commitment to help 30 companies implement some new advanced mm-hmm. manufacturing technology. So whether we help them, you know, directly build and install a system or we act as more of a consultant and help them navigate the process so they can get to a final solution that's implemented, uh, we have to help 30 companies do that. So overall, that the program includes a combination of everything from, you know, advisory to training to actual implementation work with, with clients, uh, and then this big ecosystem wrapper. Yeah, cool. So it's not all just to fund those awesome toys that you have behind you. <laughs> no, actually, surprisingly, uh, a lot of what we have is is things that we've we've uh, built out over the past few years, uh, but they were just kind of in, in different corners of the building and used for different things. And we've tried to build out like a, a much more formal, nice looking automation lab. But yeah, there are some really neat toys. And yeah, I think I feel really privileged to, to have the opportunity to to use these things, to learn all these technologies and to work. We have just an incredible team uh, that's over here doing all of this work. So is that a, is that an that. open invite to any of our listeners if they're in Buffalo, New York, to stop by and, and check of out course. your facility? Of course, yeah. We, we like to show it off, um, you know, and we especially like it if it is, you know, either a, a small and medium manufacturer or it's somebody in the vendor ecosystem that's focused sure. on small and medium manufacturers. Uh, so we're always open for that. Uh, please reach out anytime. We'll, we'll get you in, talk about what we're doing and see if there's ways we can, we can jointly help the uh, community. Cool. That's great. Yeah. So, Matt, you are one of my favorite follows on LinkedIn. Um, I feel like you're unbiased, you know, um, I think that you post very regularly. I think that you have some great content coming out. Um, and I recently noticed that one of your colleagues characterized you by saying, you're the only person I know who comes into work on the weekends just to play with the toys. So what sparked this interest in robotics and technology and empowering manufacturers? Uh, what is it about this technology that excites you? Uh, it's just, it's funny to say that because while it's not coincidentally, while it's not robotics, I did come in this weekend to try to teach myself how to MIG weld. <laughs> it was the equipment. Awesome. And I, I did it. It worked. It doesn't look good at all. It looks terrible. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but you know, I don't have those things at home. So, so it's good to work. Uh, I, I've just, I've always been, I think, really um, passionate about technology, right? Whatever that may be and whatever comes out, trying to understand it. You know, earlier on in my in my life, it was more say computer type stuff, semiconductor uh, type things. But over time, I've really just become very interested in manufacturing technology. You know, I find it, you know, interesting, fun. You know, um, just good stuff to to discuss with people. Um, you know, in, in ways that I feel like the more I learn, the more of an impact I can make. So, you know, any opportunity I, I have to to learn something new, get my hands on a new you know, new robotic system, new toy, you know, I'm going to take advantage of that. And I think most of the team kind of feels the same way. Everybody's pretty, pretty excited about learning these things and figuring out where they can apply this knowledge. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, MIG welding is tough. Um, were you using the robot for it or were you just doing it by hand? No, I was doing it by hand. Actually, my first real ones was, uh, was with a robot, a, a system from Vectis, uh, <laughs> trying to play around on that and understand it. I was cool. surprised, you know, Okay, it's pretty easy to make a uh, a MIG weld with a robot and make it look really good. Um, so I figured I'd better take a step back and actually figure out what I'm doing because I I don't really know what's good or bad. Um, so no, this was uh, just a, a Miller you know standalone welder um, trying all different process settings, seeing what looks good, what looks bad, what works, what doesn't. Yeah, um, what what looks like a big porous puddle and what what <laughs> yeah what actually oh, comes yeah. out clean, stacking dimes big, as they say, right? Oh yeah, I'm nowhere near that level. <laughs> I got this plate back there that just has lines all over it, and you know, some of them look like I did them with my eyes closed. Yeah, it really gives you an appreciation for the skill that goes into something like that. Oh, yeah. And you know, and Absolutely. talking about skilled labor, right? It it truly is an art as much as a, a science. Um, yes, getting those things to come out correctly. Very much so. Cool. 
So um, what do you think some of the most notable benefits that small and medium sized enterprises can gain from implementing new automation technologies? Uh, lots of good benefits, but I think it's, it's evolved a lot over the years. Right now, you know, the, the people are still looking at these technologies for things like, you know, general productivity increases, quality improvements, but it really, it seems like it all comes down to workforce, right? So mm -hmm. people are just having a really hard time finding, finding workers. And even from the employee, the worker point of view, right? I think most workers have gotten to the point where they don't want to do some of these really, you know, dull jobs, right? They don't want to be flipping over the same part every time or, you know, loading the part into a machine all day long, right? Uh, so automation is giving uh, small and medium manufacturers a way to help address this workforce challenge in a way that I don't think we've really ever seen before. Uh, that's really the, the big thing, you know, and it's helping both the employers and the employees from what we can tell. And we're, you know, we, we try to be you know, very socially conscious about, you know, as we as we help people identify automation opportunities and ways that help everybody and we are seeing a really kind of a, i think a big uptick in that understanding you know it's it's uh do the you know the the d's that everybody talks about the dull dirty dangerous you know difficult you know those are the key things but really right now it's all about labor yeah what are some of the other new technologies in automation that you use beyond for example cobots uh, so we use quite a few supporting technologies. We do focus a lot on collaborative robots, but obviously that's not it. A lot of vision system technologies. Um, so different things like that, parts feeding, you know, flexible parts feeders, uh, some of the stuff you can see maybe behind me in the pictures. But uh, we're also developing some new technologies to be able to allow uh, you know, collaborative robots to, to be controlled from a remote distance, so telemetry. So it's not all about just using these technologies, but in some cases it's about developing and being at the forefront of, of these new technologies. Very cool. Yeah, that seems getting back to that idea of, you know, working within the process of what they have. Teleoperation is definitely something that allows them to kind of, you know, automate, but also have some risk reduction measure in there uh, to not need it to be necessarily 100%. You can still have some eyes on it remotely. Yeah, and it's also, you know, I, I think a much more cost-effective approach, right? I mean, to... To automate, to fully automate a system, let's just say it's a it's a fairly complex welding application, right? To fully automate that, you know, and to have the robustness you need and the flexibility you need is a lot more complicated and expensive than, you know, a human in the loop operation where you can still have a person, you know, taking care of the, the parts that require a lot of dexterity, but now they might not have to do it in that environment. So think of something like grinding or arc gouging. These are applications that nobody wants to do. Right. But it still requires a lot of dexterity. So if that person can now do it from a safe environment or even possibly from home, it just makes that job much more appealing. It makes sense. Do you have trouble justifying that? Um, you know, for example, when you're advising manufacturers, a lot of times the cost calculus kind of just comes down to like, will it replace a worker or, you know, will it um, allow me to lower my labor costs in by X amount? With the human in the loop, you're still preserving that worker. Uh, do you ever find that cost calculus doesn't work out for manufacturers, or they they don't mind? They still go for it. So I think I think the the cost calculus is a little bit different there because the the telemanufacturing side of things addresses something that's more of a uh, the the workers that have been doing these jobs simply don't want to do them anymore, right? Or they're retiring, right? So it's not so much a will it keep a person or not most of these companies that are looking at this types of technology are are totally fine keeping that person in the loop, right? Because it's the only way to get the job done. They're also trying to find better ways for their employers. You know, they, no, nobody wants to put their employee into a into a physical environment that's uncomfortable or yes. you know, dangerous. So it's, I think the calculus is a little bit different there. In general, you know, for, for automation in general, we don't really hear people bringing up the, you know, uh, the, I want to get rid of a worker part of the, the cost equation anymore. It's more, we want to help augment what's here. You know, yes, this person, the, the task this person works on might change, um, but their job's not going anywhere, right? We have 10 other positions we're trying to fill. We'd much rather put this person in one of these other positions. It's probably a better task, you know, a uh, more appealing task and have a robot do, you know, task, this boring, dull, dirty, dangerous task. 
Sure. Yeah. I'm actually going to ask my producer, Andreas, to play a clip from our last episode uh, with Jeff Bernstein. Andreas, you want to play that? Yeah. I've been talking about that for 40 years, Chris. Um, our position is that robots actually save and create jobs, that they're better, safer, and higher paying jobs as well. We looked at this over a three decade period. We found whenever robot sales go up in America, unemployment goes down. When robot sales go down, unemployment goes up. Certainly doesn't look like a job killer to me. Yeah. So that's a very macro view from Jeff, but you're very much boots on the ground, Matt. So you see that as well with the companies that you're talking to? Yeah, I would agree. I mean, I don't have the, the 40 years of, of, uh, of data there or, or history and, uh, and congratulations to Jeff for everything that he's been able to accomplish and do over that period of time. It's pretty amazing. Um, but I would say from the, the boots on the ground perspective, yeah, you know, it's it used to be all about, you know, how can we put in a robot to reduce labor, to reduce workforce? Now we're just not seeing that. We're, we're, we're seeing employers want to bring in these, these arms or other automation technology to make things easier. We're also seeing the employees, you know, uh, happy about it, wanting to see the next robot come in. Uh, I have a, just a great personal story, you know, in the past of, of doing this, the first the first collaborative robot we brought in, I was with a startup company at the time. You know, we had some of those questions up front. Well, am, am I going to lose my job? We know a robot's coming in. And so we brought the, the whole operator team up to speed. We got them involved in the discussions. We even went so far as bringing the collaborative robot over so they could play around with it a little bit, you know, a couple months before this thing was going to start. By the time it got there, they were so excited, right? The first group of people, operators that was going get to get to work with this was excited. So everybody else was saying, when's the next one going to come in? Right. And um, over the course of actually bringing in more of these arms, we were able to hire more people. Right. So I think just from personal experience, you know, I, I, I can say, yes, I agree with what Jeff is saying. Yeah. That, yeah, I, I can imagine that happening with the engineering group, you know, being so excited to get the new toy and see it out. But that's really cool to hear that the actual operators on the line were embracing that idea so much. Yeah. yeah. And, and we're, we're hearing a similar sentiment with other people. Like I mentioned, when we do these site assessments, we, you know, we were often talking to people on the floor as well. Uh, there's been some times in the past where, you know, somebody would say, OK, when we go out there, don't say the word robot. Don't 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 talk about automation in front of people that are that are working out here. Let's talk about it when we get back to the office. That doesn't usually come up anymore. You know, we can have discussions usually with the operators and we've seen operators doing jobs where, you know, the maybe one of the, the worst ones I've seen was somebody that all day had to pick a box off one conveyor and put it onto another conveyor. Right. And yeah. Now, there's simpler ways to address that than a robot, um, but those types of jobs, nobody wants to do those, right? So if you talk to somebody now that does that job and say, hey, we can we can put a robot in here or we can find some other way to do this for you so you don't have to do that task, you're going to be able to do something better at the company. They're usually pretty excited about it. There doesn't Very seem cool. to be that fear like there used to be. Very cool. So we've talked a lot about the benefits and kind of the, the good side, so to speak, of the journey. Uh, when it goes well with operators and things like that. But what are some of the more common barriers or concerns that you see when people are facing this adoption of new automation technologies and how do you help them overcome them? Sure. So I'd say there's there's two. I'll start with quickly the, the easy one, but I think this is also kind of an excuse sometimes, is on the cost side, right? So cost does come up, um, but it's usually from what we can tell not really the barrier kind of just one of those first things that people are concerned about. The, the big one that we really see is, is bandwidth, right? So somebody at the company has to has to lead this project, right? Yeah. They say, okay, we're going to implement this new automation system. We've never done this before. You know, this is all totally new to us. They have to, they have to navigate that whole thing. They have to figure out, okay, what are we going to automate? How are we going to explain this? How are we going to find system integrators? They probably don't even know what the term system integrator is, right? Um, where do we go to buy this system? How do we get it installed? How do we, you know, and those things take a lot of time. And for a small manufacturer that's, you know, the leadership team is constantly fighting fires, they might know, and they usually do know that they need to automate. But as soon as that discussion is over and the next fire comes up, they don't have the bandwidth to work on it anymore. So that's what we really see as the biggest um, hurdle. Everybody wants to do it but they simply don't have the time in the day to plan out that project and to execute that project. So a big chunk of what we're doing and a big, a big reason we're excited about this program is it's all geared towards helping 
through all of that, right? taking that burden away, giving them external resources that can help navigate through that whole process uh, because they you know, just simply don't have the time. And when they do get the time, they don't know where to start. So they're going to jump to another problem. Yeah, I think it's kind of important to to highlight that, you know, these companies are good at what they do. Like they're in business, they're making oh, products, yeah. they're making good products, right? And so I'm sure they have the intellectual capacity, the engineering capability to be able to put one of these things together if they really wanted to. But as you say, it is, it, you know, the bandwidth thing makes a lot of sense. Uh, and they just struggle to kind of visualize the journey from where I am today to how I'm going to be where I need to be. Right. Exactly. You know, and, and especially if they haven't done this before. Right? I mean, it is it is a risk. Right. Like you said, they know what they're doing. They do it very well. And that is absolutely true. You know, and to go from a process that's been manual to automate, it is a big change. Right. I mean, that can be a very scary thing. There's there's costs, there's time involved, there's retraining, there's team. And then there's always that nagging, I think, feeling in the back of their head, back of their mind of, well, if it doesn't work, no one's going to trust me in the future. Right. So there's a lot of things that have to go right. Now, I think all those things are getting easier and also easier to justify. But for, for a small manufacturer, it's a it's a big first step in the in the creativity and the ingenuity is absolutely there. We we see amazing things at these sites. Sometimes you go to a small site and you're just like, wow, who, who designed this? This is awesome. Like, yeah, how have you been able to figure this out? So, yeah, they definitely have the ability to do it. They just usually don't have the bandwidth. Yeah. I, I want to highlight one thing that you mentioned there that I think is kind of important because it does come up a lot of times. So we, I, I kind of think of this as a clear path, right? Like I, I, I want to be able to help empower these companies to see a clear path from where they are today to where they need to be. And one of those key decisions along the way you mentioned it is like, picking a system integrator, or are you going to use a system integrator? Are you going to try and DIY it? And I think that's kind of that decision paralysis that kind of comes into effect. Sometimes they're like, oh, we have the intellectual capacity to do this. We could DIY this. We don't have the bandwidth right now. So maybe we should go external. We're losing a little bit of that uh, knowledge gain, that ability to gain uh, experience in doing that. But if we are going to choose a system integrator, how do we choose? Because there's a million out there it's not transparent all the time. It's like, it's way worse than getting a quote to like fix your house up or something like that. It's like even more opaque in terms of what the actual costs are going to be. So how, how do you help advise on that in particular? I can imagine that's a point of contention. Yeah, it is. In, I mean, to be clear, like most of these technologies nowadays that a small manufacturer is, is looking for, especially if they're thinking of like like a small cell, a collaborative robot cell, or, or some other standalone technology, to say like a, you know, just a, an automated vision system, they can do this stuff on their own. But if they haven't, we do usually recommend they work with someone to do at least that first one, right? We've been to far too many sites that have kind of that that proverbial boat anchor, right? It's a, a robot sitting in the corner, maybe with a tarp over it that no one wants to talk about, right? And and we don't want to see that again. So we do usually tell people to do that. Either we can help them, or we can get them connected with a, an integrator partner. Um, but that, that is that is a big challenge. Now, I will say the ease of use has, has really improved uh, on a lot of these things. And I'll, I'll jump back to Cobots for a second, right? It's all of us here that have kids, they've all used them. You know, it's one of my favorite stories is, you know, we had this, uh, this person came in with their two kids and one was a teenager. He wasn't too interested, but there was a younger one, a nine-year-old who was just super interested in using it. So. I spent a little time, taught him how to like teach the robot to pick up a block and move it to another location. And I was about to teach him how to move it back so he could kind of make a, a cycle. And he just looked at me and he says, no, I got it. And it was just the coolest feeling, right? Like he, in, in about 10, 15 minutes, he picked it up and he understood how to do that. So if you're in a manufacturing environment, let's say you're a machinist or you're a welder, if you already have those skills, it's going to be very easy for you to learn the basics of how you need to control this robot. However, uh, as easy as that is, or as easy as it is to troubleshoot, there's still that whole development aspect. So when you're putting in a system, yes, you can pick up a block and move it around pretty quickly, and you can train someone how to use the system quickly. But when you're developing the system, there's a whole different skill set and thought process that goes into it. So we we try to tell people don't get too don't get too caught up in the ease of use and think that you can just jump in and this box arrives and tomorrow you're going to have a full application running on your floor. If you're going to need to build it all yourself, you should probably still work with someone to do that first system. 
Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And I, in my experience, I've seen that it's, it's more about, you know, looking at what your current manual process is and understanding that on a, a really detailed level. I think a lot of people take for granted the kind of adaptability or ingenuity that humans have and how many things that a human, if you just throw them in there, will just figure out, you know, uh, they really need to analyze that on a, on a detailed level. And once you have your manual process truly mapped, then you can start thinking about your automation. Yeah. And you hit on a, on a really important topic there, right? Which is, excuse me, thinking about your process first, right? It's uh, it's very enticing to just say, oh, we can just throw technology at this thing. Uh, but then that just becomes a band-aid, right? So even though we call our, our, our assessments a lot of times automation site assessments and it's all about the technology, we're also looking for process uh, opportunities. And we're always telling people to focus on your process first. Don't spend money on technology until you know your process is working properly. In fact, we take that so far as we do a lot of our projects uh, with uh, organizations in the MEP network, so Manufacturing Extension Partnership. Mm -hmm. That way, we're kind of looking at this jointly from both a process and workflow and a technology standpoint all at the same time. Okay. So MEP, I've heard that before. I'm not really sure exactly. So MEPs will help a company look at their process and help them to automate it better. Yeah. Oh, sorry. So MEP stands for Manufacturing Extension Partnership. It's a program through NIST, a national program. Uh, each state has at least one MEP organization. Some states like New York has several, in one in each region. And those organizations are great because they go in and they focus mostly on like the process and the workflow improvement, and site layouts, and a lot of times the non-technology aspects of these things. Uh, and they're just great organizations to work with, usually a wealth of knowledge. So by partnering with them, you know, we can go in and we're kind of looking at the problem more holistically, right? The last thing we want to do is, is recommend somebody install some, you know, automation solution and not realize the other problems we might cause by doing mm. that, right? So we want somebody else that's going to kind of be paying attention to the whole workflow, the bigger picture. Yeah, it's kind of, it seems almost like a loss, uh, 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 sunk cost fallacy in some ways where like, you know, it would be great for companies to just look at their process and analyze that. I'm sure they'll realize gains in that, but they almost use the adoption of new technology as a catalyst to help do that in some ways. Yeah, I think that is true in some cases. You know, sometimes it gets people excited. You know, you, you start to implement this technology and then maybe your process issues become a lot more apparent very quickly. Right, right. right. Making bad parts faster. Um, and then you're forced <laughs> to do it. But it's still better if you if you think about the process first. And then you put in, you know, automation where it makes sense. I, I like that. I'm going to, I'm going to make that a new personal slogan. Don't make bad parts faster. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think back to the first episode and I, I, I follow uh, SpaceX a lot and, you know, Tesla as well went through this with their model three, but Elon Musk has like this five, like, you know, step thing of like, how to do manufacturing and the first part the first thing is like just delete the part or process just just get rid of it right if you can the less that you do is better and all the way at, at the very end number five is automate and i think that kind of gets to the same point of you know you really have to look introspectively at your own process to decide um you know what where are the efficiencies to be had there it also reminds me of a book i don't know if you've ever read this matt but it's one of my favorite books to recommend to people uh, it's written by sam bouchard a robotique and it's called lean robotics and it kind of blends these principles of of lean you know uh, manufacturing with the idea of of robots as well and it kind of it really talks about looking at that process and the inputs and outputs literally mapping the inputs and outputs of your processes and then start applying those to uh, to an automation project. Yeah, I agree. Actually, I have read that. I have a copy of that at my desk. And, and like you, I recommend that to a lot of people. I yeah. think it was a very good um, a good way of kind of blending, you know, lean manufacturing concepts with, with robotics in a way that I had seen someone explain it before. Um, it aligns very well to a lot of the work that we do uh, and that we try to talk to people about. So, you know, I would agree with you. Excellent read if someone's looking for a... Uh, you know, a good starting point for where you should add robots and why, and, you know, some of the, the pros and cons. It's a, cool. a great way to, great explanation. Cool. 
So uh, we've talked a lot about process, but I want to talk about a little bit more about you and what does it mean to you personally to be a part of people's automation journey? Uh, I love it. It's something I never thought I'd be doing uh, before, you know, and uh, got very involved in doing this type of stuff, say, five years or so ago. Um, it's it's just very rewarding, right? You know, when whether we're helping somebody just identify an opportunity or we're helping them actually implement a solution, it's great to know that we're having an impact. And I think even even more, you know, um, there's even more of a positive feeling, I'd say, with the fact that a lot of these are with smaller companies, right? It's Big companies a lot of times can afford to have automation teams and their own internal resources, and they still, you know, get external help when they need it. But these smaller companies just don't have that, you know, and there's not there's not a ton of resources out there for them. So I'm I'm thrilled to be able to do this, honored and, and thrilled. Awesome. Can you share a success story? You mentioned one earlier about um, you know helping operator or having excitement when an operator. Uh, gets involved, but can you share another success story or an example of how your team's efforts have directly impacted a company's operations or helped them achieve a significant improvement through automation? Yeah, sure. Uh, one that comes to mind a lot is with an aerospace company, a local company here. And so when you think aerospace company, a lot of times you're going to think, you know, highly automated, very advanced, right? But aerospace companies, just like, just like a lot of other companies, you know, a lot of the work is still done manually, right? Assembling parts and performing all these tasks at, at manual workstations. So one of the ones we found, I think, was just a perfect fit for automation. So this started off with one of these automation site assessments where we had kind of gone in, we identified a whole bunch of opportunities, helped work, work with them to prioritize those. And the one that got picked that they wanted to move forward with was they had to take these small um, little tiny plastic filters. So they're, you know, few millimeters by a few millimeters uh, diameter and height. And those have to be put into these these uh, boards, uh, for, for lack of better terms. And people would have to do that all day long. So picture taking these tiny little parts out of a bowl, putting them into a slot, and just doing that over and over again, right? It's a very tedious job, but a very important job. And there was a lot of pretty tight requirements on the process for what these, what these parts were used for. So we helped them kind of sketch out a concept for what this could be, help find system integrators to do all the work, and then help them work through that entire process. So from the time uh, we, we came up with the idea with them to the time this thing was up and running on the floor, we were there basically holding their hands because they weren't sure how to do all of this, all of this work. Uh, ended up leading to a very nice robotic cell, fully automated, you know, and now all they have to do is just load in a tray of these little parts, hit go, the machine will find the, find the the board that it needs to, it'll find all the individual holes by itself with the vision system, and then just start plugging away. And just just think about, you know, think about doing that as a job, picking up a little part, putting it, picking up a little part, putting it in all day long, right? And from what we can tell the folks that were there that were doing that job before, are thrilled. Awesome. Yeah, that, that's one that always comes to mind. Cool. So with the rapidly advancing field of automation, what do you envision as the future of manufacturing? Are there any emerging technologies or trends that particularly excite you? Uh, yeah, I think the two big ones beyond, you know, what we're seeing a lot of right now, I mean, certainly AI, it's just, it's incredible how far that's advanced, or how, should I should say how fast that's advanced, you know, just in the past couple of years, whether it's, you know, personally or, you know, in, in the manufacturing setting, it's just everywhere. And so we're, we're even seeing products come out that are already, you know, AI compatible, you know, vision systems with neural network capability that are easy to program, <clears throat> that kind of stuff. So I think we're going to see a lot more of that. I also think we're going to see a lot more around AMRs or autonomous mobile robots. And I, I will be the first to admit, years ago in my career, you know, when AMRs were first coming out, I, I, I did view those as more of a fad. I thought they weren't really going to go anywhere. Um, but now, you know, they, the technology has gotten so good, so much safer. We're starting to see really good applications for them. Um, I think that's going to really start to improve. And I think the combination of that and AI and, you know, onboard robotics are going to be kind of one of the next big things. Yeah, I have to admit, sometimes AI, that, that word gives me a little agita because it's just such a buzzword. <laughs> but it's it's good yeah. to hear you reinforce that. And AMRs, it's kind of like what manipulators are like, you know, robotic arms in that uh, it's it's introducing order to chaos. And I think a lot of people underestimate just how chaotic 
a manufacturing uh, floor can be uh, for both a manipulator and for a robot scooting around on the floor. For sure. I agree. And yeah, it just like a lot of other things in this industry, the, the, the buzzword aspect is certainly there. And, uh, and AI is one of the big ones. I mean, admittedly, we've been using AI type technologies for years, right? It's just now yes. like everybody is claiming it. Yes, exactly. So we talked about so many cool things in the last uh, 40 minutes or so. Um, I kind of want to just reiterate the core question and just have you summarize some of that back to us. So the core question is, how do you automate the non-automated? So I think the big thing there is to, again, I'll go back to start with your process, right? First, look at your process, look at what you're doing, determine if it even should be automated, right? Everything can be automated, right? There's no, there's no limit to what could be automated, but not everything should be automated. So first of all, look at your process. Then second, make sure what you're looking at is something that should be automated. There's a good ROI. There's a good reason to do it. Um, preferably, it helps both you as the owner or the employer. And it also helps the people that work on your team. Right? That, that's kind of the best case scenario. That's what we always try to aim for. Uh, then it's really about you know, coming up with concepts and being creative about what you're trying to do. You know, as I mentioned, anything's possible. So when you're thinking about how to automate the automated, you really got to kind of step back. And I think you really have to have a good idea of what are the different technologies out there? What are the ways of doing stuff? You've got to have folks on your team with experience to say, hey, I've seen it done that way. I can do this. What about this? You know, how, what if we try using this technology? Come up with those concepts and really dive into those concepts, you know, and, and try to rip them apart, you know, to understand, like, is this going to make sense? Is this going to work? Maybe it's going to work, but it's going to be so complex that it's not worth the effort. You know, you don't want to automate something and then it's constantly breaking down. Um, so I think those are the key things, right? Your process, make sure it should be automated and then be creative on what you're trying to automate. As far as getting it done, you know, what we would still or I would still recommend if it's your first time or even your second time. Once you're at that point, find a system integrator that can actually build it for you. You know, go to them with a really good scope of, or a... Or a description of what you're looking for and go with your concepts. Here's what we think we should do. Here's our thoughts, you know, but listen to what they're saying as well, because mm. they've been in this industry, they've been in the game, they understand what's going to work and what, what isn't um, and go down that path. And I think you'll be pretty successful. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. I, I definitely appreciate that. Don't go empty handed, kind of go with some ideas, go with some feedback and, and be able to be a, a bit assertive as well. Um, oh, yeah. Just like you would with any contractor, you know, Yep. Oh, you definitely have to go with, with those ideas and more importantly, that, that clear definition. That's actually something we, we hear is a kind of a big blocker, you know, to a lot of automation projects. So a company will say, we want to, we want a machine that, that does X with very little description, you know, of what that is. And then of course that means that it's just from the, the system integrator side, it's just all risk, right? They, right. they don't really know exactly what they're aiming for. So now the, the quote is going to be very high. And the company doesn't understand why it's so high and it's because there's this mismatch there right and so if you're a small company one of the best things you can do is if you're, if you're thinking about an automation project spend a couple hours to put together a really really good specification yeah you know, you requirements x y z here's the requirements and maybe here's some things that it should not do that here's things that we prefer the more clear you can be the more accurate of a quote you're going to get back yeah yeah, and that that includes floor space sizing, you know, uh, part sizes, different runs of things, and and everything like that. Then it becomes kind of a discussion with the system integrator where they're like, "Oh, you want it to have eighty percent of your product portfolio uh, in this machine? That's going to cost you a lot because you actually have these few products that represent fifty percent. If you just focus on this part of your portfolio." you know, maybe it'll, it'll help reduce the cost of this project. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's true. You know, you don't have to, you don't have to bite off everything at once. Yeah. Cool. Very good, Matt. Thank you so much. I'm going to move into the rapid fire question section. This is where I just spit a lot of stuff at you. I want your gut reaction. I want your uh, initial take your hot take on these things. Um, we have about four questions for you, so I'm just going to jump into it if that's cool. Yeah, let's go. Cool. What's the most interesting or unusual application of automation you've come across in your career? Hey, Andrea, I should have to edit this one for a second. That's okay. I'm trying to think. Yeah, I was thinking like about Dr. Silence. It's good. 
the most interesting. I meant to think more about this. We can uh, skip this one. I would say, okay, so to me, the most interesting application I've seen personally in my career was one we did with a, a company that I used to be at, which was uh, building laptops and tablets right here in Buffalo, New York. And so what we did is we ended up working with this dual arm collaborative robot, and each robot had five operators sitting around it. So five people were interacting with this robot essentially at the same time. Uh, the operators would physically build these laptops. So think about all the, the operations that require a lot of dexterity, and the collaborative robot would actually put in all the screws, right, which is the part that's the more challenging, more ergonomically uh, stressing part of the job. Uh, I'd say that so far has been the most interesting one and, and, and one of the most fun ones that I've seen. That's that's a great example. I love that. Yeah, a robot's actually being a tool there. Cool. Um, second one, if you could automate any task in your everyday life, what would it be? Yeah, drywall. Uh, so, you know, uh, sanding and, and spackle work. I, uh, I'm terrible at it. My wife doesn't want me to do it. it never comes out looking good. I've, I've yeah. got this vision in my mind of a something called a spackle bot someday i've got to work on it. <laughs> that would be my favorite that would be a heck of a robot because that is a very unstructured environment for sure yes. so yes cool we'll work on that uh, All right. yeah. <laughs> uh number three what is the current book that you're reading uh the titanium economy so it's a uh, it's a book kind of about all of these industrial technology companies and you know uh uh, the work going on around the U.S. that is kind of really, you know, under the radar. You know, the stuff that, uh, that keeps our, our country moving forward, but it isn't talked about as often as kind of the big companies we're all familiar with. Cool. That sounds good. I'm going to put that on my list. And finally, um, where can our listeners go to follow you and your work? Uh, so the best place is LinkedIn. Uh, you can find me there, Matt Malloy at LinkedIn. Uh, I do try to post pretty frequently about the stuff we're doing. And I uh, certainly encourage people to reach out, you know, if, uh, if this is a space that you're interested in and uh, looking to help small and medium manufacturers, I'd love to hear from you and figure out if there's ways we can work together. That's awesome. Yeah, LinkedIn, you are a great presence on LinkedIn. So Matt Malloy, thank you once again, the Automation Program Manager at EWI Buffalo Manufacturing Works. It was a pleasure to have you on the Reautomated podcast today. Hey, thank you so much, Chris. I really appreciate it. It's a lot of fun. All right.